All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us in this uh, truly global event. Uh, we welcome you. Today's session is uh, talking about innovations from Africa that are tackling the situation we're all in uh, with the COVID-19 uh, situation, highlighting entrepreneurs and researchers. I'm joined today by my esteemed panelists, um, starting with uh, Dr. Abel Mogo. Um, Dr. Mogo is a research associate at the Epi Epidemiology Unit at the University of Cambridge, and um, her mission is to promote development that enables human and planetary health through research, innovation, and collaboration. She's worked on global public health projects in diverse contexts. That includes North America, uh, Europe, Africa, Asia, and with a prolific array of organizations, including governments, academia, uh, <clears throat> international organizations, venture-funded startups, and civil society. She's also a researcher at the Global Diet and Activity Research Network at the University of Cambridge. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Dr. Mogo. Absolutely. Thank you. It's good to be here. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Foster Ofosu. He leads knowledge, innovation, and capacity development at the Africa Development Bank. Foster is currently uh, uh, leading the integration of ICT and digital tools into uh, the capacity building efforts for Africa. He was also named one of the top 100 Africa movers and shakers in online learning in 2008. Foster serves as a board member of the International Council on Badges and Credentials. Foster is a passionate uh, individual about internationalization in education. Foster, thank you so much for joining us. Last but not least, uh, Daniel, and he, uh, Daniel is the CEO of Cape Bio and is a scientist who specializes in structural biology. He's trained in protein engineering and crystallography, bioprocess engineering, and biomanufacturing. Daniel strongly advocates for science for science that creates jobs, alleviates poverty, contributes to economic development. He's also the CEO of Cape Biotechnologies, a South African biotech firm that recently pivoted to creating PCR testing kits for COVID-19. Cape Bio's core business involves developing molecular diagnostics. Daniel, welcome and thank you for joining us as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Well, before we start this panel, I'd like to let the audience know as, as we go through and have uh, this conversation around COVID-19 innovations in Africa, feel free to, under the session section in the top left corner, post any of your questions. And as we go through the session, we'll be sure to address those questions and uh, make sure that uh, uh, we can get to them as well. So um, feel free to use that box. And, uh, you know, it's always good to hear about the diverse experiences. We have uh, Dr. Mogo joining us from uh, the UK, Cambridge, uh, Daniel joining us from South Africa, and Foster joining us from the Ivory Coast. And it's it's interesting to, to see that uh, diverse perspective. And so what I want to start with is really understanding uh, each individual's experience of supporting innovation programs during COVID-19 and how the COVID-19 pandemic actually impacted uh, the work that you've been involved with and some of the lessons learned. Perhaps, Foster, you can kick us off in terms of the work that you're doing currently at the Africa Development Bank. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, obviously, the, um, you know, the African Development Bank is at the forefront, you know, of... Um, of supporting the continent, you know, in this period of um, of the COVID pandemic. Um, so, in terms of in terms of funding, and particularly in terms of uh, in terms of capacity, you know, building the capacity of uh, of policymakers and other stakeholders in the continent, you know, to to be able to perform better. Um, the bank did make available, I think, up to about ten billion dollars in the initial stages, you know, to help the countries. Uh, build a re resilience, um, you know, to to fight the the pandemic, 
And uh, over the last several months, you know, um, efforts are also continuing, you know, to support the, the regional member countries to fight this. Um, in terms of, you know, capacity, the, the, the complex or the department that, that I represent is also uh, has had a series of, um, of e-seminars and, and webinars with uh, global experts, not only, not only African experts, but global experts, and especially in the, in the Afri African uh, member countries to discuss you know, issues around, um, around the pandemic and uh, what appropriate responses these, um, these countries can, can take you know, to, uh, to help fight the, the, the effects of, of the pandemic. So through this period, there have been a series of webinars on uh, macroeconomic, building macroeconomic resilience, um, supporting the, the youth, um, in um, in their innovation efforts, uh, there have been webinars on how to how to align, you know, the, the healthcare system, um, and you know, in, in different areas. So, in a way, we we're looking at it from the angle of yes, funding, but at the same time, also building the capacity, you know, to that that the funds can 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 be used can be used effectively. So this is from the uh this is from the from the side of the of the bank uh what i also do personally you know the other cap you know is um you know volunteering my time you know to to train and and to help develop uh, young africans you know as they are locked down you know in the period of the pandemic but also what they can do you know after after the pandemic and i was fortunate to have um about 60 you know innovation experts from about 25 countries you know, who also, you know, agreed to, to join, to, to give their time, you know, to, to really take these young, um, young Africans through a series of master classes and, and coaching, what we call the InnovAction, Innovation Program. So, yes, on one hand, there is the official, official role, but on the other hand, also as, as an African, you know, many of us are also, you know, in our own capacity, you know, giving, giving time, you know, to, to support in science and innovation uh, within, within the continent. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Foster. And it's it you know it's it's uh, it's truly remarkable what happens when we're under pressure and we're forced to leverage the resources that we have in our you know with with digital connectivity. Um, it's amazing that you were able to collaborate with uh, these other innovators from twenty plus countries to do the the other work in the. Uh, context of you know the second hat that you're wearing outside of the bank um, what were some of the key lessons that you learned as you went through that process you know in in bringing these different international uh, collaborators with you as you were supporting these uh, uh, young African innovators I think the, the the first lesson of course you know the, I was actually surprised because I didn't expect that much interest <laughs> you know um, so I was positively surprised, and in a way, it, it opened my mind and my eyes to to the fact that there are so many people, you know, that are willing and ready to support the continent. We just need to reach out to them, you know, uh, both the youth and and, and other entrepreneurs. Uh, what was also interesting was, again, you know, yes, you have the experts, but then you need to find the innovators that 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 need to be supported. And again, you know, through social media, it was it was kind of interesting that within two weeks, when the application was opened. There are about 250 applicants, you know, who are different stages of, of innovation. So it, it obviously, you know, uh, opened my eyes again to the fact that that need is there and that hunger is there, you know, by by the youth. Now the third lesson is, of course, you know, uh, technology makes makes it possible. Uh, and what I realized through the process was, you know, the need to bring science and entrepreneurship together. Uh, because usually when we discuss innovation in, 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 in the continent, we sort of discuss it as a STEM issue, as a, STEM, as a science issue to promote STEM, or then we promote entrepreneurship. But what I did learn from this was, you know, being able through, through the use of technology, being able to bring scientists together, you know, geneticists, gene, geneticists microbiologists, you know, uh, computer scientists together, you know, with, with, with entrepreneurs you know, to, to, to work together. And I think the, and also finally the combination of, you know, master classes plus uh, coaching, you know, one-on-one -on -one coaching and actually focusing on, on the technology or the product 
you know, rather than on developing skills for entrepreneurship alone. So it's been it's been an amazing experience uh, going through this. And it, uh, it it truly speaks to, you know, to a testament of your resourcefulness to be able to pull all of these different diverse uh, experts from, from all the different areas, uh, as you explained. Thank you so much for sharing. Fortunately, it wasn't difficult because there are so yeah. many people willing to, to be part of this. So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, perhaps we can get uh, Dr. Mogo's perspective, uh, looking at uh, from an academic perspective and the work that you're doing uh, at the University of Cambridge. Uh, Dr. Mogo, what, what were some of the experiences uh, in terms of innovation within your work and uh, some of the lessons that you learned as well? If, if you can uh, enlighten us with, with your experiences, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. Um, I actually really like a lot of what Foster said when he was talking about um, sort of digital collaboration. I think I'm going to pull on some of those threads as well. So a lot of the research I do at Cambridge looks at um, essentially just looking at how um, our cities are changing. A lot of African cities are changing with, you know, development, urbanization, and how is that affecting our health and risk for diseases, especially the rise of chronic diseases. And so when... Um, when COVID hit, we started having to kind of pivot a lot of the research we're doing, not to look at a lot of the drivers of chronic disease. So when you think of things like physical activity and access to infrastructure, because a lot of people are staying inside, um, access to healthy food. So we started looking at these, um, these drivers of health outcomes, but understanding also how COVID is affecting them. Um, we also had to think a bit creatively about how to gather data because now when people are inside, there are things you can't really do. Um, so you can't necessarily go out in the field when people are distant. And so starting to think of how we could use digital tools to gather information um, that, you know, whether it's sort of using tools that can capture video and voice and all of that. So there was a lot of that use of digital tools as, as well. Um, I also lead... Um, uh, with another hat, kind of like Foster, I also lead um, a network that focuses on advocacy and engagement called Engage Africa Foundation. Um, it's volunteer run. And so a lot of what we're saying is that um, most people who are dying of chronic disease, of um, um, COVID, have an underlying chronic disease. And so we a lot of the work we're doing focused on engagement around chronic disease. And so um, we stay thinking of sort of, I guess, what we could contribute because we're a network with different people from different countries. So Rwanda, Nigeria, Kenya. And one of those opportunities was looking at WHO guidelines and seeing how we could make them more accessible. So we worked on a digital crowdsourcing project to, to make these guidelines available in about 19 African language, languages. It was very interesting because we were all in different parts of the world. A lot of us were in lockdown. Um, and so it took us about three to four weeks to work to collaborate and we basically use simple tools basically google docs excel you know those simple tools but it was really about that bringing people together and just building on people's different skill sets to make them accessible make them engaging in terms of the format and then a lot of this um volunteers were also on the ground so a lot of them were already doing a lot of work around community engagement so they were able then to disseminate it and use it in the work that, we, that they were doing so those are some of the um, experiences around innovating um, during COVID that um, that's that stand out to me. That's uh, that's fantastic, Dr. Mo Dr. Mogo. And in the, under four weeks, that's truly amazing how you were able to leverage you know uh, simple digital tools to be able to uh, go through and translate those standards uh, into the 19 languages as you mentioned. I guess one of the questions that stands out for me. Because of that rapid pace, did you run into any hurdles or challenges as you were going through that process? What were some of mm -hmm. those uh, challenges and how did you overcome that, uh, those uh, through that journey? Mm -hmm. Um, we had to be very resourceful. So we had to think on our feet. At first, we thought, let's see what's out there. And then in talking to a lot of people, we found that there's value in having something that sort of standardized because people can trust it. You know, if you say this is coming from the WHO, for example. So thinking about like the source of information thing, it was really about thinking of what information would be useful to to make accessible in this way. And I think of just the different skill sets of people. Then we say, think of how do you quality control? So we start having people speaking different languages validate. Um, so it was, a, it was um, 
it, it required a lot of just thinking on your feet and resourcefulness and drawing on a lot of diverse skill sets from different countries but it was it was really fantastic at the same time so it was quite intense but then it it, it was also fantastic yeah and i guess um relating to maybe i can also respond to your second question as well about sort of what were the learnings from that i think one thing that has really stood out to me during this period has been that well, innovation is, well, innovation obviously is about new science and technology and things like that. It's also very much about um, using what we have, you know, and because there was a lot of repurposing. So you had a lot of people repurposing already built infrastructure around re responding to Ebola, to respond to a pandemic, you know, things around um, contact tracing, emergency response. So innovation is very much not just about what um, new things, but it's also how we use them, how we make them more accessible, how we make them more affordable, how we make them fit for purpose as well. And I think that a lot of the work that we have to do is in that area. And that's also, um, it's also quite as important and quite as, we like to say difficult, but very important. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you so much for sharing that. It, it, it seems, you know, if I could encapsulate that in a, in a behavior, it would be inventiveness, right? Of, mm -hmm. of being able to approach uh, a challenge or, you know, and it's not always creating something new, but perhaps doing something more effectively uh, with the resources that you've been given. And I think, you know, the, the uh, experience that you described truly speaks to that. So thank you for, for sharing that. Thank you. Daniel, um, would you like to add to that and, and share some of your experiences as well as uh, as you went through the, the pandemic and any of the innovative works uh, that uh, you've been working on? Absolutely. I think both my colleagues are 100% are, are, are right. I think, you know, the, first, the, the focus on the tech itself, it's very fundamental, but I would like to add a second layer there. The most important part, or the second layer to that, is the focus on the solution, than the tech, because the tech is a driver for the solution. And uh, Ibele, you, you speak about using what you're already having to respond to the human threat. And that is exactly about responding to a solution for a threat that uh, I was speaking about earlier on. So I, I, I totally agree with you know, your opening remarks. Fundamentally so given Africa's position or uh, um, um, historical uh, um, uh, challenges associated with you know, being able to respond to pandemics of this nature effectively and, and, and making sure that lives are, are saved, but more so the livelihoods are, sa are saved. From my space, um, as a company, we knew that, you know, even before the pandemic, that we struggled to contain Ebola um, and, and many other diseases that are prone to Africa um, because of lack of um, uh, uh, instrumentation or, or innovation that responds to that what I call human threat. Um, we rely on imported products and those come with a lot of uh, deficiencies because of our, our, our geographical location and the climate henceforth, and including uh, very poor infrastructure when it comes to value chains uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and supply chains, etc. So. As a company, our response and our formation was about how can we bring this gap much more uh, uh, thinner using exactly what my colleagues say, what we have. Uh, because Africa is not only endowed with minerals, but it's a scientific field, it's a scientific hotspot. The, the indigenous biodiversity hotspot that we have around our continent has more value, uh, and many people argue, than the minerals themselves. Because we speak about healthcare, we speak about uh, food production, uh, we speak about pharmaceuticals using uh, indigenous knowledge systems. Uh, it's, it's a whole range of resources 
that Africa has, uh, you know, what I believe we need to work around is ensuring that we create a scientific base with individuals that innovate for a solution, not to innovate for innovation. Um, with, with, with us, uh, um, uh, um, we, we, we say that the pandemic uh, presented both a challenge and opportunity. Uh, a challenge in a sense that some of the activities that we were doing as a company, including uh, um, you know, how we used to generate revenues in the US and in other parts of the world, when you shut those little chains, you're simply having to struggle with, with your employees. So we say, how can we use what we have to respond to the pandemic? Because what we do is to harness our biodiversity hotspots in Africa in sourcing uh, uh, enzymes that are used in diagnostic applications. But we were not using those for, for diagnostics, but rather for normal molecular biology research, which is a field uh, that is mostly involved uh, uh, with DNA manipulation, DNA analysis, etc. Uh, or genetic uh, manipulation and, and, and analysis uh, of, of viruses, humans, plants, etc. So we had to pivot to look at the problem that we were going to face as a country, but as a continent, and say, let's use our resources and our capabilities to then see how we can replace some of the imports that we know very well that are going to discuss. And we know what happened in the pandemic. Most countries uh, were, were, were stopping uh, the export of certain key uh, resources because they had to utilize those resources uh, uh, for themselves. And we've seen that now even with the vaccine. The same thing is happening where rich countries are protecting themselves by three times more than what they are required. So we as Africa has to be in a position whereby we are able to use what we have to advance and, uh, and safeguard the lives of, of our people, but more so to contribute to the global um, uh, 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 you know, solutions uh, that be. Because the problem that we're facing now is a classic example of what could come as this pandemic starts, the new waves are coming through, and, uh, and uh, Ibele, you, you will agree that this is just a classic example of what could happen around the world. Should anything wrong go? Where are we as Africa in terms of innovation that respond to a solution to save the lives of, of, of our people, especially in rural communities. I think that's where I wanted to, to, uh, to touch, uh, complementing what my colleagues have uh, already laid a uh, good foundation. Wow. Thank you so much, Daniel. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting the, the, the importance of insourcing and looking at nationalism. Uh, and you know, th there's an old saying, uh, what forms under pressure? And, uh, we all know diamonds. And I think that's the, uh, opportunity here in Africa, looking at the, you know, the, the next generation of innovators and looking internally again, you know, working with, uh, what is available. And, uh, I think we're going to need, uh, leaders such as yourself to, you know, catalyze that future for Africans to be able to uh, support that infrastructure and also to be able to propel uh, the future. So thank you for, for that perspective. I think it's, 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 uh, it's truly enlightening. Uh, the next question is for you, Daniel, as, as well, um, because you're able to, um, you know, go through this process and come up with uh, testing for uh, COVID-19 in in this situation, I'd like for you to elaborate on the idea behind your innovation, and you know the steps that you took to be able to rapidly uh, deploy this uh, with the with with the constraints that you had during COVID nineteen. Can you talk to us about your innovation and, and that journey? So, you know, our, our journey has been um, a short one because initially we we wanted to pace ourselves. Uh, take things step by step, um, uh, um, supply uh, uh, reagents, PCR reagents to researchers because that's, that's sort of a, a solution that we wanted to provide because most of them were 
really, uh, uh, you know, delaying uh, to graduate because at times they wait up to six months for reagents. Um, unlike uh, where you are, Dr. Mogo, you, you order today, I mean, uh, you know, within one hour you can have your reagent. In Africa, it can take up to six, six months. And, and that, is, that, is, that is a big problem because that's, that delays our innovation. So part and parcel of our, our solution was to say, how can we enhance Africans to be able to conduct their research so that they can finish their work, so they can publish and, 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 and patent and do all that they need to do in order to advance the scientific community in Africa, especially given pandemics of this nature where you need the very same people to innovate. How, do, how will they innovate if they don't have the agents? So ours was to respond to that. But we had to say, let's look at what we have, uh, what we can uh, be able to do in as far as our portfolio is concerned. I bought these technologies for diagnostics and build a diagnostic platform for COVID-19, but also looking at other uh, diseases, uh, other viruses that we, we are confronted with in Africa. So we say, let's build this platform first to respond to the pandemic, but later, we will be able to add other, other, other platforms in order to respond holistically to the diagnostic shortages around Africa, but more so while supplying uh, our researchers who were our primary uh, customers. So the innovation really comes from uh, the reagents or the enzymes that are sourced in Africa, developed in Africa, manufactured in Africa, processed in Africa, and distributed from Africa. Because Africa before us was a net importer of all these reagents, among others. So we said, let's play in this space so that we can assist where we can, so that we can reduce the reliance on import that are associated with trade deficits, uh, exchange rates uh, uh, that uh, at times uh, uh, you know, put us in a very poor position. That's where we were. And uh, likely we were assisted by the government of South Africa throughout this process, throughout these pivoting uh, steps. So that's the importance of uh, you know, working closer with the government uh, and, and, and the public sector and, 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 and other entities in the private sector, looking at the solution, looking at the capabilities that we have and marrying those capabilities and making sure that we have a solution that we can present to the nation, but also uh, uh, to, 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 to other African countries. I believe that South Africa and, and Senegal were the countries that came up uh, earlier on with this solution of, of, of having their own diagnostic uh, uh, kits for, for COVID-19. And we were the company that were in the forefront in South Africa with that development. Daniel, thank you so much for sharing that journey. I think it's a, it's a true testament of your ability as uh, as both an innovator and, uh, and an entrepreneur to uh, assess a particular challenge that's uh, was being faced and react quickly to to be able to address that. So uh, I hope for those who are listening that this inspires other innovators uh, across Africa and, and beyond to be able to uh, you know practice uh, the ability to see an issue and react to be able to tackle that problem and and to create impact in a short period of time. Um, so thank you for that. My next question is around, again, so we talked about innovation and Daniel shared his his pathway to creating Cape Bio and figuring out how to uh, come up with the reagents to be able to produce this in Africa and to supply Africa. And so uh, I think it's important now to understand once you've been able to do that, uh, what is required to facilitate rapid scale of innovations, especially in emergency situations such as COVID-19? Perhaps we can uh, get Foster to kick us off in this particular question uh, from the perspective of the Africa Development Bank and some of the other work that uh, uh, you've been doing. Foster, the floor. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think you... Um you hit the nail right on the head, you know, what happens after, you know, uh, because the supply side, and I, I like, I'd like to say that, you know, scientists uh, like Daniel and Imbele, they're doing a great job, you know, they do what is possible. Um, and especially in times of emergency, you know, what, what, what is possible becomes very critical in terms of, you know, uh, putting together, you know, scientific technical knowledge to, to, to create something. 
But the biggest problem, as we observe, is uh, you know what happens after after that invention, after that creation of um, of, of the technology or product. And there is this big valley of death, you know, between create, create creating something and and getting it to the market. And and that is that that, that is a, a very big African African problem. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, at the end of the day, uh, every innovation needs somebody to want it and need it and and, and to pay for it. Now, in terms of crisis, and I think Daniel Daniel's case is a good example, you know, that, that governments and governmental agencies, you know, within the crisis, you know, rally around entrepreneurs and innovators, you know, to, to buy what they develop because they need it there, whether it's a vaccine or, or, or testing kits, as, as Daniel has done. Uh, but the real test then becomes, you know, what happens after the crisis, you know, because crisis do, do, do end. Uh, so whether the products are, devel are developed for crisis or not, you know there is all, there, there is a need, you know, to support innovators to be able to to cross that valley of death, you know that uh, that their technologies and products, you know, whether in the same form or are adapted to sort of different solutions, you know, would be needed and would be acquired in the market. So this is where you know uh, multilateral development of, uh, institutions like the African Development Bank, the World Bank, you know, also also come in and, and the African Development Bank does does that, you know, to to facilitate, you know, the sort of the entrepreneurship um, journey uh, of, of innovators to, to support them. Uh, and the African Development Bank, for example, has the Africa Innovation Lab, you know, um, which 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 supports you know African entrepreneurs and, and innovators on the market front. You know, working with uh, working with other stakeholders. And there are there are several examples like this. So this um, this is possible to to achieve, but at the end of the day, there are also you know government act, non governmental actors that need to come come into into play. Um, and my my observation also based on what what I'm doing with the youth is uh, usually innovators. If you ask any innovator what is the number one problem you face, they'll put it down to finance, you know, and lack of capital. You know, this is a cross board. Uh, but I have also noticed that, you know, for, for innovators, there is a lot of funding. But the problem, as I see, is that, you know, probably, you know, unlike Daniel, who had a successful technology that, that came out and was useful, my observation is that many of our young scientists and, and young engineers don't actually, you know, push enough to have ready, you know, bankable technologies and products that somebody would put their funding in. Um, so, and this requires a lot of capacity, you know, innovative capacity, the competence and the capability to develop technologies and products that somebody would believe in and put funding in. The second thing I see, and this is also where organizations as ours and also in, in, my, um, in my charitable uh, project. So we're looking at, at you know, data because your your technology or innovation is as good as the data that supports it where in, in, as input you know and the data that you can you also have you know as, as output you know going to the market and data unfortunately in the continent as we all know uh is a very hard commodity to find uh so what what happens then is that many of our innovators um and 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 thank you Mbele, for that um for what you did, you know, putting data together, you know, around um, around the, the pandemic, you know, uh, but because because these innovators don't have access to, to data, they start approaching the market based on how they feel, and and what they think, uh, and investors are not interested in how you feel or how you think because everybody loves their children, everybody loves their product, you know, but being able to have access to to data and having the capacity to analyze the data to support. You know how your, your your technology would work, how your innovation would work, and why you know anybody would buy it or invest in, invest in that. So I see that you know going forward, you know we need a lot more of um, of focus, you know, to support scientists and entrepreneurs, you know, to to develop technologies that are market ready and investment ready, and to find the right data, you know, not only to help develop the products and technologies. But also to help push them out to to the market in order to avo avoid the the valley of death concept as I talked about. 
Thank you so much, Foster. And, uh, you know, that valley of debt is, uh, is a testament to most entrepreneurs. Uh, they need to cross it at some point and, uh, go through falling into it and, and building the, the resilience to be able to get up and, and climb back out of it. And, uh, I think that's, that's part of the journey of commercialization. And, um, I think you, you hit the nail right on the head when you talked about the capabilities or, the, the capacity of, you know, there, there are great researchers and pure inventors or innovators, um, and then there are great entrepreneurs. And uh, perhaps, you know, and this is, uh, this is not just a, uh, an Africa problem. I think, you know, here uh, we're, I'm based out of Canada. We have the same issue. We're great at doing research and development, uh, not so great at commercialization. And I think it's, it's really, uh, you gave some examples of, of your work of being able to bring people together that can complement and provide uh, that support. And even uh, with Dr. Mogo's uh, example of uh, in four weeks being able to bring people together to create something meaningful and actually deliver that impact and then look back. Um, I think, you know, those are, those are key uh, components. So thank you so much, uh, Foster, for sharing that perspective. Uh, perhaps we can get the from the other side, from the innovator and entrepreneur. Daniel, uh, you can talk to us about your ch the, the challenges as you uh, came up with the innovation, Cape Bio, and your journey into uh, scaling that innovation uh, in, in the current climate. Thanks again, Shay. I think there is, a, there is a saying in South Africa, probably in other parts of, of the continent, maybe Kenya, that says it is not yet Uhuru, meaning it's not yet over. I, I hope the translation is, 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 is accurate. We are not yet out of the bushes. Innovations that have potential to scale up and respond to this current pandemic and beyond have to be given maximum support. If we did not learn from this current phase, then I would say that Africa will never learn. I'm not talking about my kind of innovation or my innovation, I'm speaking for all African innovations that came and wanted to contribute and yet were sidelined by a whole range of red tapes, some of those man-made, because whether we like it or not, Africa is still battling with corruption, maleficence, and, and, and all types of challenges. Yet we, we have the youngest population in the world. And these are the brains that should be driving African innovation and African emancipation economy and beyond a, a, a just economy. And if we do not get rid of these red tapes, we are likely to face the same challenge even with the vaccine and even beyond that. I like the work that Foster was speaking about because it speaks about how to harness different capabilities, put them in the same room, and make sure that they rub shoulders with each other, that they share resources and expertise. In that format, they bring about that solution. In our journey, we realize that maybe, maybe it's, 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 it's something that is not ideal uh, to speak about, but we realize that most African countries or, more, or most African laboratories that are doing uh, this type of research prefer, you know, products from Europe or US or even China. South belief is very critical if you want to stabilize an African continent. Africa has potential and we have proved this over and over. And I believe that we need to trust in ourselves. It, it, I think I said in one platform that we are revered or loved by international players than we are, uh, you know, by Africans, which is uh, not uh, you know uh, proper because Africans should be proud of what they are doing. See how you can complement what others are doing to enhance the ecosystem. We can we can share the resources 
uh, with other African laboratories doing testing. You know, in fact, we can donate resources. We are not all about money, we are about impact. The genesis of the company was about making sure that we contribute to African scientific community. And we do not deserve some of the relatives that we face, but it's part of business, it's part of the startup environment, it's part of competition. But in the face of a pandemic, you do not need to borrow money to buy something that you can get next door from your brother. So these are the challenges, these are the stuff that uh, uh, some of them that we face, even though we are offering the solution. But I think apart from that, we collaborate with uh, researchers at universities and research councils to innovate so that we can take those innovations to the market as a company. And that has inspired those that we're working with to even do more, to respond and have solutions that we can present to, to, to our local markets and even international markets. It is very critical that African scientists find a common ground where they set up foundations for innovation and value chains and, and, and distribute in China for their technologies not to study science for the sake of science and publication. Yes, knowledge economy is very critical, but science without an impact is useless. I'm sorry, it's not science, it's just you breaking about what you do in your laboratory. If it does not feed an African child, then it doesn't belong in Africa. Maybe it belongs somewhere where there's money. Here, we need to create science that have a meaningful impact. And this is the journey that we have started and we are collaborating with uh, uh, researchers that are at university and research councils. But still, even through that, there are still challenges whereby uh, uh, you know, the competition with multinationals tend to take us and, and put us on the side. And at times, self-belief and trust from our own uh, clients disable us from uh, scaling up our technology so that we can expand it throughout the continent and beyond. Thank you so much, Daniel. I think um, you know a lot of provocative thoughts for us to take away and think about. Um, Dr. Mogo, would you like to add to that uh, question before we move forward? Yes, thank you, Daniel. I love what you said was music to my ears <laughs> around doing impactful science. Um, I was just thinking that you know it's it's predicted that there's going to be more pandemics, right? And so we have to, I think a big um, part of this question of rapidly scaling innovations is sort of, again, that question of access, you know. So um, now when people are talking about COVID vaccines. And I recently read this article about how there's a lot of sort of the global politics of that where there's questions around intellectual property, there's questions around, okay, how do we make it accessible and for low-income countries? And then having infrastructure, you know, for example, to store. So these are all questions around like one innovation. You have, we have a lot of digital health tools and then the question becomes like, the, 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 there's that tendency when we have digital health tools to focus on who can pay, right? So what oftentimes you find that you're segmenting the market and then you're serving those who can afford it. But when you're looking at a health problem, the question is then how do we make sure that these tools or what kind of business models might make sure that these tools are accessible to those who might need it the most as well. Um, you have um, information, sort of the product I worked on where we have information, it's there, but it might not be accessible in a way that people can use it. You might have diagnostics but then there's no power so there's that whole question of um access i think one one um important thing is that how we think about designing solutions as well making sure that there's that if we want to have pan-african solutions we also have to in involve like communities and the population not just in de in deployment but in design as well of solution. So that's one thing I wanted to add to the discussion. And then another thing I was thinking about was um, some of the challenges that Daniel was um, mentioning, because it, we sort of have to think proactively about the ecosystem and not just the solution. So it's like, how do we shape the market for what we want, right? And this becomes very important when we think about the fact that we're going to have more pandemics, right? So there's 
solutions that we need to deal with the pandemic, but there's also solutions that we need to keep Africa healthy so that if a pandemic comes, we reduce that risk that a lot of people are going to die. And that gets us into the question of sustainable um, growth, sustainable, sustainable development. And that gets us into the question of sustainable infrastructure, because if people are living in cities where they're exposed to pollution, they don't have housing and all of that, you're basically putting people at risk for chronic diseases, which then makes them more likely to die in a pandemic. And for those kinds of solutions, then we, we need a lot of patient finance as well, because we need, um, we're going to need a lot of investments in things that may not always work with sort of a traditional um, market model. So that means that if we want more of innovation around this long-term complex challenges, we also need to shape the market and we also need patient finance. And I like, I like what Daniel said about um, having the support of the government, support of the government, impact investors, or whoever is sort of thinking of um, not just now what solution, not, not just now just inventing, but what kind of you know, inventions do we want to incentivize? Because if you have those kinds of policies, if you have R&D infrastructure invested in the solutions that we need, then we're going to support innovators to do more innovation around the challenges that we have. So I think thinking about that, what, what does it take to shape the market to have the innovations that we need is a very important question. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Mogo. And it, you know, as, as I listen to you, uh, what comes to my mind uh, over and over again is the importance of systems-based thinking, right? When we think about a country or when we think about a continent uh, and when we think about sustainability, I think the other side of sustainability is systems-based thinking because we can't have sustainability without thinking about all the actors. Um, another point that I think you, you made mention to is around open access and i think that's that's a that's a critical thing when we think about intellectual property during a global crisis um, one of the things that our organization prepper foundation uh, did after the first wave in may of this year we were the first organization to do a global open innovation challenge for covid 19 solutions following the principles of open science i think that's that's necessary as we think about, you know, coming up with solutions, but making sure that there's fair access or creating a level playing field where, you know, uh, somebody in Europe or in Australia or in the United States coming up with an innovation should come up with creative ways, building on the pillars of open science so that there's open access, open collaboration um, and mobilizing that knowledge uh, more and more. Um, the last thing that I heard from you that I just want to uh, reaffirm is the importance of public and private sector collaboration, right? We can't do this work alone. It, it requires uh, close collaboration with government, uh, the, the private sector, the entrepreneurs that are behind the innovations. Uh, there needs to be uh, an open dialogue for that to, to take place. And so I wanted to thank you for highlighting those uh, those key points and, and reaffirm that for, for the listeners today. Um, moving on to the next uh, topic that we want to talk about. In terms of the observed frameworks that you believe should continue to be strengthened, and I think we started to talk about this uh, as well, uh, in supporting the innovation works that you're working on or collaborating in, uh, what are some of those uh, frameworks and where, where do you see areas for further development? Perhaps we can uh, start with Foster and, and, and uh, continue the conversation from okay. there. Okay. Um, I, hate to, I hate to disappoint you, but I think um, personally, I think we, we, we need quite a bit of work to do to create the framework that works for Africa. Um, I know that at the continental level, at national levels, there are, there are innovation frameworks, you know, including the STISA by the Africa Union, you know, uh, science, technology, and innovation for Africa, you know, around which, you know, the uh, innovators in the continent are supposed to be pushed. But I do struggle, you know, with existing, you know, frameworks that, that have wor worked elsewhere and how, whether or not they would work uh, or continue to work in Africa. Um, we talked about ecosystem recently. I've been thinking about this. Actually, do we do we really have an ecosystem in Africa? You know, as an ecosystem should work for innovation. 
because there is a framework, you know, uh, systems approach to innovation, which which works in several places. But what I do notice is that within within the continent, because a system is a system comprises stakeholders, you know, who work together and collaborate and share resource, resources and, and all that. But what I do notice is that we do have a, we do have these stakeholders, all right, you know, they do exist, uh, but are they working together, you know, in an ecosystem where I don't think so. So if there is one thing that I think we need to improve is is about you know strengthening the linkages that should exist you know within within the stakeholder within and among the stakeholders in the ecosystem you know not just policy and not just having the stakeholders together for example you know uh, the the triple helix framework you know talks about you know university private sector and uh, and uh, government collaboration you know to to push for innovation but at the end of the day, you know, what we see in many countries in Africa is that these three three units are blaming each other. Universities are blaming government, governments are blaming the private sector, the private sector is blaming everybody. You know, so it, it, instead of working in, in the triple helix way to make things happen, you know, they're rather they're rather fighting against each other. And within the ecosystem, the researchers themselves. Uh, Daniel talked about trust, you know, uh, but the, 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 the issue is that I think in um, um, the, the issue is when our scientists <laughs> continue to work on projects that bring foreign funding, you know, and which change the frontier of science. It's okay to change the frontier of science, you know, it's possible to do, but that do not necessarily, you know, bring impactful, you know, solutions to the, to, to, to the, to the continent's problems or to the country's problems. Not only will governments not be so willing to to fund, you know, because the intellectual property goes somewhere, you know, if you just provide inputs to to the research, but private sector is not interested because the again, you know, the, the output goes elsewhere. So that trust must also be earned in the in the sense that our scientists, as much as they're chasing the frontier of science, should also be helping solve the, the continent's problem. My last point on this is that I think even the way that innovation and entrepreneurship is positioned in Africa is not clear. Um, and, and I'm working on an initiative to, you know, to get like-minded together to start discussing how do we position, you know, innovation and entrepreneurship in Africa. Because across the continent, you know, we're, we are playing with, the, with what I call the North American model, you know, which is the Silicon Valley model. You create something, you go to private sector, you get your funding, and then when you are ready to go to the market, go international, you find the government agencies that would help you. And then the, we also play in with the European model, which is that government supports you to do R&D, and then when you are ready to go out, you go to private sector, you know, to find the funding to go to, 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 go to the market or to go international. And then there is also the European, the, sorry, the Asian model, which I think is a combination of, you know, first developing the, the private sector and getting the private sector to push innovators. So we have a continent that is playing with so many different models, you know, not, none of which is contextualized in Africa, really. You know, um, we don't have the private sector or individuals with deep pockets. So the Silicon Valley model doesn't really work because we still go back to, 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 the, to the rest of the world to get the private sector funding. You know, we don't have it. Uh, we cannot really have the you know, European model because our governments don't have the resources to, to provide everything. I mean, we're struggling with basic infrastructure, like roads and hospitals and bridges and all. You know, and we cannot have the Asian model because we don't have the big conglomerates. You know, most, most companies in Africa are really small, about 96% of that. You know, so the more we need to find going forward, you know, we need to have that discussion among scientists and, and um and, and entrepreneurs, private sector and government, what is the African model for innovation and, and entrepreneurship? And until we are able to identify that and encourage that triple helix, you know, collaboration or linkage, I'm afraid we're not going anywhere. Sorry that I, I end on such a negative note, but. I think, you know, with, uh, it's it's a call to action really, Foster, and so thank you for sharing that context because I think it's important uh, for everyone that's listening to, to seriously challenge themselves to think about that and to reach out to this panel and uh, think about other colleagues and how they can actually uh, address that. And perhaps, Dr. Mogo, you can uh, add on to what Foster said and, and provide your perspective.
Honestly, I, I think it's quite thorough. Um, I think that um, I was thinking about this question as well. And I, when I was thinking, I was like, you know, we already have a lot of sort of global frameworks. So I was thinking, you know, the sustainable development goals, they work pretty fine, you know. But I think the question is really how do we operationalize it in a pan-African way? And um, Daniel had mentioned something that I think is very important, that we're, our population is very, very young. And um, there's a lot of sort of infrastructure that hasn't even been built. And there's this question of, okay, so how do we, I, I really think that there is an opportunity that if we can drive our development in a way where like this, this, this becomes, if we use research and innovation to drive our development in a sustainable way, I think there's that opportunity because like a lot of countries have, you know, so-called developed countries have done, a, they've already done it and we're seeing sort of limitations of that. So the question is like, how can we use research and innovation to then shape our own development to produce what we want? Um, I don't have an answer to the question in terms of what um, Foster had asked about what is the African model, but I'm very interested in this question. And one of the ways I think that we might explore it is to look at who the deviants are, like what countries are actually doing impressive things in certain areas and then what worked for them. So kind of um, maybe not necessarily working from the top down, but just looking to see what, who are the outliers and what did they do that might have worked. And so some of the work I actually do, because my area of focus is um, solution oriented research. I'm really interested in like research that produces solutions, research that produces impact or ca can contribute to impact. So I think that one opportunity there is just to sort of I guess figuring out what what people might be doing well, understanding what one of the things I do is kind of see cities that are sort of are similar or have similar histories or characteristics. Are there things they can learn from each other? Um, and so I think really I think a key part of this would be thinking of what kind of knowledge may also support us in innovating, and it might not be the sort of the traditional way of like you said. We, um, removed research where you just come up with a topic and, you know, go and do it and publish or whatever. I think it's things that are a bit more embedded. And I think they're good examples. Like I, I came across an example um, actually in Ghana around a successful project trying to increase access to community health care. So I think essentially what I'm saying is that if we look not necessarily top down, but we just look at examples of what is working, it might give us a better sense of what we can learn and then what we can learn from each other to build more of this pan-African model of innovation. So it's a very interesting question to me that I'm exploring, but I, I won't say that um, I have an answer yet, but I'm very, I think that's an important question. Thank you, Dr. Mogo. And uh, perhaps we'll pass it off to Daniel to add any final thoughts to that question. Yeah, I'm going to be very, very short. Let me, let me throw my dice. It's a very, it's a very critical question in our ecosystem as scientists, uh, by entrepreneurs, etc. You know, I always say that if, it, if, if it's science or if it's innovation and it does not feed an African, then it's useless for Africa. If it doesn't respond to the needs of Africans, then that innovation is not African. The problem with our sort of attachments to um, foreign standards, not to say those standards are irrelevant, they are relevant, but we have to determine our own standards and those standards will determine the kind of innovation that we create for Africa. If the innovation does not say how do we lift people out of poverty for, in Africa, because our challenges in Africa Yes, we have challenges that are similar to Americans, but majority of our challenges as Africa are unique, and they require that our innovation respond to those. I think that's the dice that I want to, to throw. Lastly, democratization of innovation is what will take Africa out of this crisis. Mm -hmm. We need to create innovation that speaks to us and that speaks to the solutions that we want to bring on the table. But more so, we must make sure that everyone has access to, not only a few. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Daniel. And I think, you know, that's a, that's a great way to wrap up this amazing panel. And uh, I'd like to thank Daniel, Dr. Mogo, and Foster for a lot of the provocative thoughts. I know uh, I certainly have a lot of key things to take away. Uh, and maybe perhaps we'll, we'll summarize those. Um, again, thank you so much for the panelists. Um, final thoughts to, to, to leave behind, democratizing African innovation and the challenge for everyone listening to collaborate and look at what is the Africa uh, infrastructure for innovation and entrepreneurship. I think that's a, that's a great uh, takeaway as we talk about COVID-19 innovations, but also the pandemic will end and we still need that infrastructure. And so um, it's uh, a lot of key takeaways. So I'll do that with you and uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Thanks everyone. Thank you. And thank you for being such a great moderator. Great job. Thank, thank you. you.